Hi. So as Diana introduced me, I'm uh, Jean-Baptiste Avia, CTO and co-founder of Screen. Uh, I see some people standing here. You have a uh, free room here, so feel free to, to move and take a seat. That's the, that's the right time. <coughs> uh, so I was, uh, at the beginning of my career, a pen tester, and I spent like five years at Apple uh, working on Apple ecosystem, like iOS, macOS, reverse engineering, cryptography attacks. We attacked the systems and we helped uh, Apple developers uh, make them more secure and write more secure code. Today, this talk is not going to be about generic technical vulnerabilities. I'd like to introduce a uh, way to defend your company against business logic threats. So let's take a step back in time and look at what applications were looked like in the in the 20s in the 20s 20 years ago right so you had a, a lot of custom code and not much frameworks the developers were writing a lot of low level things like handling sql queries handling connections to external services vulnerabilities were lying in this custom code 20 or 10 years later frameworks became predominant in the applications. The amount of code written by the developers was reduced and focusing on the business logic, not anymore on the generic technical things that were relying on frameworks, right? And everything got a bit more secure because frameworks are shared across the community uh, and the community is improving them. Nowadays, uh, the monolithic applications are going away. Applications are relying on others to call, uh, to fulfill business uh, requests, right? So each time you need to do something, your application relies on external services to get billing information, uh, user authentication. So the biggest remaining threat today is not the general technical vulnerabilities, but the business logic threats. So what's an attack against business logic? Well, it could be something targeting a costly operation of your company, like ordering a pizza. It could be something targeting a security action, like adding credential to a given user. It could also be accessing confidential data, like downloading a payslip. All of these are business logic actions that are very sensitive and that could be targeted by an attacker. That's specific to you, right? Domino's Pizza won't have the same business threats as Twilio or as the FDA. So such protections cannot be generic. They need to be tied to your business. So who in this room has more than 10 applications to protect? More than 50? More than 100? Hmm, uh, more than 1,000? Okay, ah, the, that's, a lot, uh, that's a lot of applications. I see a sweet spot around more than 50, I think. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a lot, right? And uh, it's moving in the direction of more and more applications, right? Squads are working independently on applications. They are pushing code every hour. They are deploying their applications multiple times a day. And uh, each application rely on others to fulfill its purpose. So how do we protect against uh, business logic threats in these conditions? It's not possible to do it uh, on the network level, right? Because the actions are lying inside your code and distributed across multiple applications. It's not possible with solutions that, such as static source code analysis because they are not looking for the same thing. So we have to understand the business meaning of the actual code of the actual applications. So the solution is to decentralize the security across each and every application. We want the security to run the closest to the runtime and to the business logic as possible. So that's the closer to the business logic you can be, right? Inside the application. So each app embeds its own security logic. It means that if a user request is going into your company, several applications perform several actions. Some of them are sensitive. We want to react if these actions are abused. So 
you have the big picture, but how could we do such a thing in practice? We want to collect events at runtime from inside the applications where the business logic lives, right? So we need to build a toolbox to help us do this. The first item on this toolbox is a simple helper that we can call each time a sensitive action is performed. This helper will send information about what's happening in the application. This helper, we need to put it inside each and every application every time some sensitive business logic is performed, all right? So the goal is to record each sensitive action at runtime when it's performed. Second item in our toolbox is an event stream. Okay, all this information we are gathering, we want them to be in an event stream in order to process them and analyze them. That's the third item of our toolbox, processing and analysis engine, okay? The goal here is to detect security anomalies based on the business behavior of your applications. So last but not least, the fourth item in our toolbox, the security responses. We need to respond each time we detect a security anomaly. So the response could be we want to deny a given action or to log the user out. Many things could be done. So we have these four items in our toolbox. We need to architect them. We need a way to, to drive them conjointly. Using any streaming engine, we can quite easily express high-level logic, such as, all right, if the rate of the function user token generation is unusual, then I want to log the user account, and I want to be alerted by sending a webhook. Another way to, to say this is, okay, if I want to count the uh, number of calls to a user impersonation function, if this number of calls is more than 10 in one minute, then I want to raise an exception and to call uh, a pager, for instance. So that's very similar to the way performance monitoring evolved in the past 20 years. To monitor performance of your applications, 20 years ago, you were looking at the latency. Okay, it's a, it's a measure that you had on your load balancer, reverse proxy, and that were telling you this page is taking 100 milliseconds to, uh, to respond. It was working, but it's not the best uh, visibility you could get, right? What you want is to get more detail from inside the application. That's where tools such as New Relic or App Dynamics have been helping the developers, telling them, all right, that's the database who's uh, taking too much time, or this external service is very slow. This even was one of the enablement of the DevOps movement because developers and ops were working together to optimize the performance of the applications, thanks to this visibility. So AppSec is taking the same direction from perimetric and external protections to decentralized protection inside the runtime of the applications. So how do we want to do this at scale? I'm sure as uh, AppSec practitioners, you envision a lot of issues here, right? Um, who is working in his company with two weeks sprints, or whose developer is working with two weeks sprints? Yeah, uh, maybe longer, three weeks sprints? Yeah, I guess two weeks is the, is the norm, right? Uh, that's slow. Attacks are minutes. When you want to counter an attack or to detect uh, something happening in your, in your company, you don't have two weeks to respond, right? Uh, the, the order of magnitude is more the hour or the minutes. So. Anyway, we don't know by heart where, are, where is the security logic lying in all of our applications, all right? It's too big. Like many of us manage more than 50 applications. It's not possible to uh, know by heart each and every of these applications. Anyway, the developers are pushing every day, deploying applications every day, and the whole organization goal is to make the developers move faster and faster, right? So um, it's, it's not possible to manually put this inside each and every application. And as AppSec teams, we don't want to break this flow, right? We don't want to, to break the developer's workflow. Uh, first of all, it would slow down all the company, and secondly, it doesn't work usually, right? So uh, it's not possible to do this by hand. We need something that can push 
this security information to us uh, without involving the development teams. The way to do this is dynamic instrumentation. So what is code instrumentation? Here you have a function flow, right? That's, that's a program execution, several functions. At some point, a function called authenticate is called, all right? Um, so it's highly sensitive, this function. We would like to track it. How could we do this? There is a famous example every, everyone know in this room, that's the antivirus. Antivirus, each time you open a file on your computer, they will proactively check if the file is holding a, vir a virus or not. How does it work? You did not change anything uh, on, on your machine to install an antivirus, right? The antivirus transparently asked your operating system to replace the opening function with its own opening function. So each time any program on your machine is opening a file, the antivirus open function will be called first. That's simple code instrumentation. It's a widely known and used technique, so we could do the same in web applications, right? In our case, instead of saying, oh, I want to check if there is a virus, I will call my helper. You remember the first item in my toolbox. And this helper will send information to our event stream. Okay, so that's code instrumentation, but it's not enough. We don't want to hard code this information. What we want is to be able to automatically drive the application, telling it, all right, I want you to record this function and this function and this function. And we want to be able to change this dynamically as often as we want, as soon as possible. How does it work in practice? Well, I guess you have plenty of languages across your organizations. 50 applications? Don't tell me you are using only one language. I don't buy, I don't buy it. Um, so I guess one of the languages could be Ruby. But anyway, my point is you have several methods to handle dynamic instrumentation. Ruby is one of the simplest examples because that's a very dynamic language, highly reflexive. It has a lot of built-in helpers to help you do this. Here we just take the original method, we rename it, and we create our helper method, we rename it with the original function name. We just have to tell our helper to call the original function, and that's it. Or the Ruby program will believe that it's calling the original function when our helper will be called. Ruby, quite easy. Let's take Java. It's not the same. Uh, you know, Java is compiled. It's not um, as trivial to change as Ruby. You need to deal at the bytecode level. To do this, you have several libraries that help you do it, like Java ASM that allow you to write plain bytecode. It's a pleasure. I love bytecode. But to do this at scale across uh, running applications, mm, not so easy. Uh, so usually you use a third party library such as ByteBuddy, which is open source and help you instrument applications as much as you want. So not as easy in Java as in other languages. I'm not even mentioning PHP, uh, whose core engine is C, the only API is in C. Um, Node.js, not so hard, but you have specific use cases for each function, but it's possible in each language to use such, uh, such helpers. You can think of it as attaching to any application with a debugger, right? It's possible to do it remotely. A GDB you attach with the PID of the application and you can do whatever you want. At any point, it's the same. So if you do this, you are hooking running programs. You could retrieve all the context you need, right? So, because you are inside the application, inside the framework. So you might be able to say, hmm, the, this is an authenticated user and our helper we be able, will be able to send this information to our event stream. And so we could retrieve like custom business information. Mm, this function that is adding a role or a permission to a user, well, I want to gather in my event stream this role or this permission. Also, we are in the framework. So I can gather any information related to, my fra to the framework that I want. Uh, is there cryptography? What is the, the route uh, that is being called? Any information you can ask. 
also it's a web application. So what the web application receives is an HTTP packet at the beginning, right? So you could get any information from the layer seven. Also, if we are in a microservice ecosystem, we could also get information about the previous service that was called. And if you are using spanning information to understand the perfect flow of your services across all your company, well, you could record this information as well. Now, that's the theory, right? But if we want to do this at scale, we need our developers to trust us. And if you tell your developers, oh, install this library, don't worry, it's gonna do magical thing and uh, the upside guys won't bother you anymore. It's not completely true, right? But uh, it's what we would like to do. This library needs to be bulletproof. We don't want to have like performance impacts on, on the developer's applications. So one way to do it is to build a simple and reliable architecture. You spawn one thread that is reading on a queue, okay? And then each time a hooked function is called, you can easily push an item in the queue. And so it's the Ruby or the Java virtual machine that will handle this perfectly. When some CPU time is available, I will run the thread that allows me to gather this information and send them to the event stream. You could do this as much as you want, every second, every 10 seconds. Anyway, the impact on the application performance will be minimal, which is uh, what we wanted to achieve. Of course, it's best for reliability as well, because let's say for any reason the network is down or the event stream is down, well, the thread can wait before flushing all the data abroad. So how could this work at scale in my library, in, in my company? I will ask each team to include this simple library. This library, when the application starts, can fetch instrumentation directives from a server. I will write this file and I will ask the application to instrument any function I want. In this case, it would be the uh, token generation method of the user class. And I want to say, okay, send me the, some properties such as the impersonated user here. I could also say, all right, I want the impersonation method of the user uh, class. I can ask anything. My applications will retrieve this information. And we could imagine that they are retrieving it like every minute. So each time I change this file and I want to hook a new method, a new sensitive business call, I can add it easily in this file. The applications will retrieve it. So each time any application calls something you have instrumented in the file, we gather it and we retrieve it in the event stream. So based on this event stream that is now filled of many plenty data, what can we do as an analysis? We could take a look at the volume of calls. Is this helper calling a, called a lot or not? We could look at the successive actions performed by a given user or maybe a given IP, maybe broader a given organization. We could also detect unusual activity, running some machine learning algorithm, forestry, whatever, on this streaming engine. We could find anomalies in volume, in proportions, per IP, per user, per application, per organization, per group, whatever, it depends on your business. And also, we could check the logic flows. Are these IPs in general calling these functions in the right order or not? All of this is up to you because it's your business logic and that's the place where you need to configure things and to react, to detect things accordingly to your business. Once we have detected things such as uh, anomalies, uh, and we have been able to raise security alerts, we want to respond. What's powerful here is that lying inside the application, we could imagine implementing any kind of security response we want. So we could deny access completely to sensitive functions. We could also deny access to a whole service. We could mark an account as read-only, so this account is not allowed to push things anymore in the database, for instance. We could lock a user account or log a user out. Also, generic uh, alert methods like uh, triggering a pager, firing a webhook, or creating a ticket. All of this is possible with this. It's up to you. 
let me ask you a somehow personal question. Is there anyone working at Facebook in this room? <laughs> Two weeks ago, 50 million user accounts have been stolen at Facebook. That's a lot. And no generic technical vulnerability has been used by the hackers to get this information. Only business logic flows. Three flows have been uh, impacted here. The first one, on Facebook you have a view as function. This function allow you when you post something to check it as your mother, for instance, to see if you have not, if she will see the, the thing you intend her to see. The second issue, this first, sorry, that's not an issue. So the, the view as function, it's supposed to be read only, obviously, because you don't want, uh, Facebook doesn't want you to upload things on the behalf of your mother, all right? So the first issue was that a video uploader was displayed on the view as page. First issue. Second bug, the video uploader was generating a token with credentials valid on the Facebook mobile APIs. Second issue. The third issue is that this video uploader, when called in the context of the view as function, was generating token for the impersonated person. So if I were doing view as my mother, uploading a video, I would be able to retrieve AP, the, the credentials for the Facebook mobile APIs. All right, that's how the hackers have been able to impersonate a lot of people and uh, automating this, they managed to retrieve token for a lot of external users. So I'd like us to guess how Facebook is implementing this thing. I, I'm really sad nobody is from Facebook actually because I, I, I'd love to get their feeling on that. Uh, but if you have friends, uh, I'd, love to, I'd love to get in touch. I think there are some Facebook guy in, this, uh, in the conference. Um, so let's try to guess. To, to be honest, I, I don't even have a Facebook account, so I'm, I'm maybe not the best to, to discuss it. Let me know if you, if you disagree. But I think from a developer point of view, that they have like three distinct, distinct services. The video uploader service, the view as service, and these two ones are publicly facing. Um, the last one would be the user token management service. This service is uh, generating token only for the two other view as and the video uploader. So what do we want to record? If we were in the Facebook security team, warning, to secure uh, this kind of flows, what are the things we'd like to instrument? From my point of view, I would instrument the impersonation function and the user token generation functions. So how do I solve it with the framework and the toolbox we have built together? First, I want to record the business logic actions, right? So instrumenting these two functions. This will put events in our event stream each time these functions are called. Second, I want to define rules to detect a vulnerability exploitation. Probably anomalies detection here is, is more than enough. Like is a user calling the impersonation too much or is a user calling generate token too much? And then I want to trigger security responses. Okay, if I was a Facebook security engineer, I would not block the user right away, right? I would probably let this model run for a couple of days, couple of weeks to see how it goes. Only tag the users uh, that have been doing bad things or supposedly bad things. But once I'm pretty confident the thing is working, there is no reason not to block the user directly or flag them for review. To build it at scale, well, you need data streaming engines. These things are getting mainstream. Kafka, Kinesis, Google GCP, available everywhere. Then you need anomaly detection. Can be done in any way from the, the simplest uh, form to the more advanced IA algorithm. But most streaming engines allow you to plug easily systems to do it. So if we sum it up um, from our Facebook use case point of view, then I have uh, an instrumentation file that is managed by the AppSec team, right? And describing the functions I want to instrument. These things are retrieved by all the applications of my company. 
these applications, when they run at runtime, each time a user request triggers one of these actions, they will stream this data to my event stream. My business logic, uh, my security business logic will run in the processing and analysis engine. If I detect something bad, I can respond and lock the user out. We've built a simple uh, open source project uh, aiming at illustrate these uh, use cases. Don't use it in production. It's uh, for uh, testing purposes. It's built on uh, Ruby. I'd love to get your feedback on this and uh, we could improve it together and move it further. It's open source. Feel free to open a pull request or to submit issues there. Don't use it in production. That was our take on uh, protecting applications from uh, business logic attacks. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Would you have some? And I'll be in the in the hotel lobby after uh, for uh, for the next two days. Also, please don't forget to vote when you will leave the conference to say if you liked uh, this talk or not. Thank you.